Next week I need to do something better with the with the microphone, but that should work at least. Okay. Um, so last week we talked about the the outer ear, the linear processing, and the outer ear and the middle ear. This week we'll talk about still linear processing um, of the inner ear, and we talk about the the anatomy specifically of the inner ear as well, because that will be of great importance to you for your future. Right. This is the overview favorite overview slide. We follow effectively the path of the sound from the outside, outside of the pinna, the outer ear, into the ear canal. How long is the ear canal? Three centimeters roughly, well done. Into the, the middle ear through the tympanic membrane, through the middle ear bones, the ossicles, um, into the oval window and into the structure which is the cochlea, but it's not only the cochlea, there's a complete organ which consists of effectively two sensory, well, if you like, three sensory, four sensory systems, um, which all finally are attached to a nerve, the eighth nerve, the auditory nerve, um, the auditory vestibular nerve, which comes, w which goes through into the, into the deeper brain areas later on. Through what we're concerned with mainly is the cochlea and the cochlear nerve, but we also need to understand that there is a direct connection to the vestibular system and the vestibular nerve. By the way, this here up here is the facial nerve, which runs through the same um, tunnel, the uh, internal auditory meatus. Uh, you know what the facial nerve is? That's wha what actually controls all the muscles in your, in your, uh, in your face. And is really, really close and actually runs through or very close to the tympanic cavity. So it's very easy to damage if when you do cochlear implantation and things like that. Okay, the actual name of the labyrinth is called bony and membranous labyrinth. And you see that the bottom part of it here is the cochlea. And the top half is the, the mem membranous labyrinth. The about the cochlea we talk about the next hour. Here let's talk about a little bit of the bony and the membranous labyrinth. It is a system of interconnected channels within the temporal bone. So the whole thing call is called temporal bone, the Petros portion, and it consists of the semicircular canals, which are these ones here, uh, and the vestibule, and the cochlea down here. The human cochlea is about two and a half turns. Other animals have longer, other have shorter cochleas, um, mice, as far as I know, have about three turns. It depends on how much frequency selectivity they have or frequency range. Um, the membranous labyrinth is enclosed within the bony labyrinth, and the auditory portion is called the cochlear duct, and the vestibular system, well, the vestibular portion is called the vestibular tract. Um, and uh, th 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 these three canals are oriented to each other perpendicular. That's a bit difficult to see. I'm sure you've seen the big plastic model in the, in, the t in the skills lab where you can see them and they are all perpendicular to each other. I can't run around here. Uh, because that way you can detect motion of the body, of the head specifically, in all three dimensions. You can roll, tilt and pitch. They all have individual um, detectors. They what, what they are inside is fluid filled ducts effectively and what what happens is that the fluid remains static while the head moves so the fluid moves relative to the uh, to the to the to the labyrinth and hair cells inside pick up this motion amplify it and will tell you which motion which which direction you're moving this is only for movement detection you also have a detection of a of a static uh, direction. Imagine you're sleeping for eight hours with your head down. You we wake up. You still know that you're lying down. That is not possible to detect with the canals because they only respond to motion. For this, we've got the utricle and the saccular, which detect um, static pressure, static pressure to the front, and static pressure downwards. So the whole thing in itself is like an iPhone with lots of sensors, if you like. 
<laughs> and they're all integrated later on going through the nerve and the brain makes sense out of that. Why do I tell you all of that? Because these systems are extremely similar, they have evolved together, they share the same fluid. You see that there's a little connection down here. They're all fluid filled, we'll talk about the fluid, the endolymph um, and perilymph a little bit later and they actually share the same. So there's the same fluid that is in the, in the, in the basilar membrane um, that transports sound wave that we'll talk about later a lot um, the, uh, is, is freely flowing into the canals and into utricle and saccular. Evolutionary they have evolved the same at the same time that is clear from um, uh, 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 fossil evidence and they also have the same kind of nervous system so the hair cells that we discover later on in the cochlea are pretty much the same hair cells that you find in, in, the, in the vestibular system so and obviously they share the same nerve so if you have a, a hearing problem it is often or sometimes connected to a vestibular problem as well and the other way around um, specifically things like schwannoma where you have an, 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 an um, cancerous growth on the which presses on the nerve it will affect your, your vestibular system as well as your hearing system. Okay, There's we now concentrate on the cochlea, so the, 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 the three and a half, two and a half turns of the cochlea. We put it upright and we cut it through sagittally so that we basically look into the tracts here. These are the, it comes out here, goes in there, comes out here, goes in there, and there's a third one which isn't shown up here. Oh, it actually c goes in here, comes out there, goes in. You see? Can you imagine that three dimensionally roughly? Um, that's the spiral ganglion down here. Remember that? Because this is where the, all the nerves sit that go into the cochlear nerve. So we've got lots of spiral ganglions one here, one there, one there, one there, one there. So, in fact, it goes all the way around the cochlea. Now, the fluid in here is in, in these what's called scale. We've got not one of these ducts, but in the cochlea we have three. Scala tympani, scala vestibuli, uh, scala media, and I'll blow that up in a second. And in between, they have a number of membranes that we'll show in a second. First of all, what we're going to do is to unroll the cochlea. Then I'll tell you already what it's actually doing, what it's for but there are a number of definitions of uh, words on here that we need to understand. First of all, we need to understand where the sound comes from. It comes through the tympanic membrane, through the middle ear bones. They're not really on here. This is the stapes, and the stapes vibrates, and it sets the motion, uh, the, the fluid that's in here, into motion. And if we unroll it, the cochlea, then you can imagine that it will, um, that, that sound waves will travel through this fluid up, the cochlea through the helicotrema at the top and then down again. We'll see a bit more about that later on. This is just the, 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 the 10,000 feet view. Um, a few definitions. The bit that's in the middle, so the, the, the membrane, I go back, the membrane between the scala vestibular and scala tympani, the, the main one, that's called the basilar membrane and that's what's a bit, well schematically, a bit over the top um, plotted in here. And we've got above the basilar membrane, scala vestibuli, below the um, scala tympani. Um, we've got the, the, the base and the apex of the cochlea. And at the end, we've got a hole in the basilar membrane, which is called the helicotrema, where the two fluids above and below are in contact. Now, these things here are the frequencies. And we discover that later, because what the basilar membrane is doing is to select specific frequencies. Okay. Here's a bit more information about our three scalae. Scalae is Latin plural for scala. You have the, the outer two, scala vestibuli, scala tympani. Um, if you see an SV or an ST later on, this is what it means. They are connected at apex via a via narrow opening, that's the helicotrema. They are filled with perilymph, which is peri, Latin, outside. So, lymph. Latin for fluid. So they're filled with a fluid which is outside. Outside of what? Outside of cells. As opposed to endolymph, which is inside cells. 
A scala vestibuli communicates via the stapus, via the oval window. I think we've got a let's go back and show you the better picture. That's probably the best picture. This is where the, the stapus sits on, and underneath is the oval window. So obviously th this thing is filled with fluid, and this is a cavity, so you can't have holes in it. There needs to be close to the environment, S and the closure happens with two membranes. One of the membranes is underneath here, that's the oval window, and the other one is this one here, it's called the round window. we we'll see in a second what that is for. Yes, the scala tympani terminates at the base by the round window and opens into the middle ear cavity. Anybody knows why we need two of these windows? Let's go back here and explain it best. Exactly, because what is the thing about pressure and fluids? Uh, ask a different way around. If you have air, can you compress that? Compressed air? Yes, bike pump, easy. Can you do the same with water? No. Water has much, much, much too high resistance for that. So water is incompressible, or fluid in general cannot be compressed, incompressible. So you cannot, um, if, if, if you didn't have the round window, which isn't on here, the round window is down there. Here's the top, the, the top one is the, the oval window, the bottom one is the round window. So if you have the, 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 op the, the at the top, the oval window, at the bottom, the round window, then you press it up here, the pressure goes up there and back, and then it opens again. So every time you press this one in, this one goes out. You've got a vibration effectively like that. If you don't have that, you can't press here. Yeah. So these are the two windows. Now the innermost canal, scala media, I'll remind you where that is. Scala media is between scala vestibular and scala tympani, this, this bit here. That's the interesting one. Um, that's what's also called cochlear duct. It's self-contained. It separates both different scalae, both other vestibular and tympani, and it's filled with endolymph. Now how can that be? I said endolymph is the fluid that is in cells, but it is also in the scala media. Uh, it has a very special role to play. It's very special in the, in the, in the body. Uh, we find out later what it is. Why? Here we have a blown up picture of the whole cross section of, of a single turn. So, basilar membrane in the middle. In fact, the basilar membrane is actually this bit from here to here, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to imagine that's just the bit that separates scala tympani at the bottom from the scala vestibuli at the top. Okay. Now, as th there is different fluid in the scala media and the scala vestibuli, so they need to be separated, and the separation happens by the Reissner membrane on top. But that doesn't have much functional, well at least not known functional um, um, significance, apart from keeping the fluids separated. Because this one is filled with, with peri perilymph, this one with endolymph. Um, spiral ganglion sits here, and the nerve cells penetrate into the, on, onto the basilar membrane, into all of this here, which is the organ of corti. So all of this that I'm circling around here together is ca called the organ of corti. That's the hearing organ, although obviously it's embedded in the cochlea and so on and so on and so on. It goes very, very small. The whole cochlea, the human is about the size of a pea, so about half a centimeter. Um, and this is only one tiny bit of that, obviously. So you can imagine that this is only a few hundred micrometers. Um, and there's individual cells that we're looking at in a second, the hair cells on the basilar membrane, and they're the ones that are actually really important for us. Okay, here's an anatomical sketch of it from Webster. I'm not going through everything again. Um, if we were to do a test in this, or an exam in this class, then a very likely question would be, sketch the organ of corti or one tract of the cochlea and name and label all the bits. Um, you're lucky you don't have to do the exam, but nevertheless it doesn't hurt to know all of these um, 
these terms and to know where they are. Right, no membrane, but, but I can't be bothered to go through it because you can do that in your own time. That's where the colouring comes in. It's actually quite useful because you sh really should know that this is the stria vasticularis, is the, the 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 cell area over here, where the spiral ganglion is, and, and so on and so on. Okay, um, here's the equivalent cross section of a of the a little bit blown up of the organ of corti with um, things like the inner hair cells, the outer hair cells, the pillar cell, tunnel of corti, uh, and so on and so on. Okay, let's define some of these things. First of all, Reissner membrane. What is that? I go back. Reissner membrane is the membrane that separates the um, scala tympani from the scala media. It's very thin, as I said, it has no functional significance. It's just one, two layers of cells. The basilar membrane is the bit that is from here to here. That's the important bit. This here is bone. That doesn't vibrate. Bone in general is, is stiff. It doesn't vibrate. But this is a membrane, and that a membrane's property is to vibrate. The, the basilar membrane is the important bit, and if we simulate something, we always talk about the basilar membrane. If we talk about hearing, we talk about the movement of the basilar membrane. What is the basilar membrane? It separates the scala tympani and scala media. Its width increases from base to apex, while the thickness decreases. We've got a slide for that in a second. Um, it supports the organ of corti, the medi mo modiolus. That's the central bony part, so th th this bit. The the auditory nerve and the blood vessels curse through it, so the, the auditory nerve comes in from from here, and a few blood vessels that are not not plotted on here are coming through here as well, to support all of these cells here, obviously. We also have the tectorial membrane, that I haven't talked about yet at all. If I blow up the next slide, I, I blow this up, let's go back so that you see where we are. The tectorial membrane is this bit up here. That's a flappy um, membrane. It's not a membrane that actually separates two things. It just sits in the scala media and sits like a blanket on the hair cells. That has a, 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 a huge function that we talk about in a second. That really is functional, very relevant. It's called gelatinous flap overhanging organ of corti. So it doesn't do very much apart from um, wobbling around. It's anchored to the spiral limbus. And then we have the stria vasticularis. That's this bit in here, only in the scala media. And these are cells, that these are all blood supply um, arteries. So th they're highly um, transparent to, um, to, to, to nutrition from the blood. They um, metabolically active epithelium that means that they supply the scala media and the endolymph that is in there with all the relevant stuff that, that comes from the blood. That, that's the difference between the endolymph and the perilymph. The perilymph is um, um, very poor in, um, in chemicals, potassium, sodium, chloride, uh, anything, whereas the, um, the endolymph is very, very rich specifically in potassium. It's like the inside of the cell, so there's a lot of energy is needed to keep up this um, well potential, as we later learn, but the, 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 the chemical equilibrium in there. That all has a reason, of course. Okay, now let's blow it up further into the organ of corti, and we recognize the, the things that we just talked about. The tectorial membrane, that's the gelatinous membrane on top, We've got the basilar membrane here at the bottom. And now the, the most in important uh, aspects in here are the inner hair cells. This is this one here. And three outer hair cells. Can you see them? Why are they called hair cells? You can see here they've got little hairs on top. And we see electron microscopic pictures on it in a second. What else do we here have here? We have some of the definitions of so the tunnel of Corti. We've got the Henson cell here. Dither cells 
here, the supporting diaphragm cells, they're all cells that keep the thing in place effectively because as you, as you remember the whole thing vibrates but it needs to be fairly stiff because the hair cells actually do something with this vibration and so these are cells that are uh, important for um, for supporting for support and also there was a a article two weeks ago in nature I, I, I read that that they found out that these um, the, 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 the dipha cells specifically are really really important to support the the hair cells so in um, they provide um, specific um, gosh can't remember quite should read that again they, they, they provide support, not only mechanical support, but chemical support to repair the hair cells. And it has been shown that they, you can boost these cells and their production of specific chemicals and prevent uh, noise-induced hearing loss for a short term. So th this is an all an interactive system and all of these cells do something for each other. What I'm going to tell you concentrates mainly on the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells, but don't forget that all of this is a, is a highly complex system which has evolved over 180 million years to be very, very functionally stable. Okay, here's a more sch speci uh, s schematic view of the organ of Corti with the inner hair cell here and the three outer hair cells, tectorial membrane, this is called space of Noël, and here are some more definitions, and you, you remember some of these. Here's a dipha cell, these are the Henson cells, and so on. This is the basilar membrane at the bottom, the big gray area. Okay, some definitions, the organ of Corti. It has the key cells, and they're sensory cells. First time I hear that, sensory cells are hair cells. Are sensory cells nerve cells? No. They're not. Do you know anybody knows the difference? Nerve cells have axons. They actually produce action potentials. We have a lecture on that later on. Whereas sensory cells do not produce action potentials. They don't have an axon. They have a membrane potential. We will investigate in, in much detail. But they do not have um, um, action potentials. So they need neurons actually attached to them. Okay, we have, humans have three, three to five rows of outer hair cells. Usually you remember three, but in higher frequencies it's actually five. doesn't matter, it's a very, very small number of, of, of these rows. We've got one row, always one row of inner hair cells. And both have three to four rows of stereocilia. These are the hairs at the apical surfaces. We'll see that in a second. The tunnel of Corti separates the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. They're formed by cilia cells, give the... Um, the outer hair cells considerable rigidity the organ of Corti that is the organ of Corti that the dieter cells support the outer hair cells give phalangeal support to the upper surface of the organ of Corti that, that means it increases its rigidity the Hansen cells are also supporting cells in there Okay, here's a scheme of to explain the dimensions, the change of basal membrane dimensions along the length of the cochlea. Um, you remember this is the, the base, this is the apex, so um, here the, the, the vibrations start. And the basilar membrane is very, th very thin and very s um, narrow at the beginning, at the base, and then it becomes wider and thicker towards the helicotrema. So obviously uh, something changes during the basilar membrane and this change translates in a functional change. At the apex of the cochlea, basilar membrane here, it's very wide and at the base of the cochlea you almost don't see it, it's just this bit here. Or if you calculate it from this end to that end you can clearly see it becomes here it's thick and, and narrow, here it's white and thin. Okay, the cochlear fluids, already mentioned them. We have two main types, perilymph and endolymph. They transmit the vibrations from the staples to the basilar membrane and hence to the sensory cells, the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. 
They facilitate ionic processes involved in detections of vi vibrations of the, of the hair cells, later more, and they deliver nutrition and remove the waste from the cells. So they, they do an o the, 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 the endolymph, um, not the perilymph, the perilymph is irrelevant here. The endolymph uh, performs a lot of, of, of tasks for the, for the inner the outer hair cells. The perilymph basically has the function of transmits vi to, to transmit vibrations. <laughs> the perilymph is the definition. It's some similar composition to other extracellular fluids. It's very high in potassium, very low in, in, in s no, very low in potassium, very high in sodium, and its source probably blood vessels within the cochlea. The the endolymph is similar to intracellular fluids. It's very unusual in the body to have that outside of, of, of cells, that is, and it's very high in potassium and low in sodium. So you see, it's just the other way around. And the stria vesticularis plays an important role in maintaining ionic composition. Um, one main reason for age-induced hearing loss um, is, or the aging caused hearing loss, is the deterioration of the uh, stria vesticularis, because it's not able to maintain the equilibrium there anymore. Okay, so much for the anatomy. A little bit more interesting function of that. What does it do? It transmits, it converts the mechanical vibration that we have in the um, in the middle ear into nerve impulses. So a mechanical to electrical conduction, if you like. In fact, what it does is a mechanical to chemical, and then a chemical to electrical conduction conversion. Because we need to hear sound. The sound is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a mechanical wave, and it has me mechanical energy. But we want to hear it in our brain, so we need to have it in the form of nerve impulses. How does that work? It also con does a frequency trans well, um, frequency mapping for us. It splits the vibrations into different frequency components along the basal membrane. Let's find out how that works. So, it is very difficult to investigate cochlear processes, but it has been a topic of research for the last 30, 40 years, and I think we've got a really good idea now how it works, but there is a lot of ongoing research still on how the basal membrane actually works. Um, wh what are the problems with it? First, the cochlea is buried very deep, so you can't get to it. In, in usually, we do experiments on, on little animals, so it, you have to get into it. The problem is, once you're in it, you damage it immediately. It's very delicate, easy to damage. So if you, if you, if you get into it by drilling a hole into it, you change the properties, the mechanical properties, that actually transmit the vibrations. So that in itself is difficult. People have got found ways to get around that for example, to drill a hole into it and then to cover the hole again with a uh, little sheet of glass, for example, th through which you can shine a laser. And that way you can actually measure the vibration of the basal membrane directly. But then again, you can only do that in the topmost um, one cycle of it. You can't get to the high frequency portions of that. Um, it's much too small to be resolved in, in imaging techniques, like fMRI, for example. You can't see anything because it's so tiny. So it is difficult because amplitudes are small, dimensions are small, and the patterns that are observed are quite complex and very hard to understand because it's not linear. It's a fundamentally non-linear. In fact, it's probably even a chaotic system. Um, but it is an ongoing and interesting challenge. And we've got even in the ISBR a few people that are still concerned trying to find out <laughs> what the cochlea is actually doing. Why it's so important for us? Because if we understand what the cochlea, how it really works, we have probably a better handle of understanding hearing loss, first of all. Um, we might have a better understanding of how to simulate it and how to produce technical devices that work similar, like cochlear implant, for example. We'll talk a little bit about cochlear implants later, um, because the cochlear implant, if you like, is a very, very 
a simplistic um, simulation of the cochlea. It, simu it, it, it re replaces everything that the cochlea usually does. And it works a treat. It works obviously very good, but it's very simple in, in comparison. Okay, now, how does this thing actually works, the cochlea? What does it do with the sound waves? First of all, um, we're looking, we have to understand the perilymph is very similar to water in its mechanical pr properties, so it's incompressible. The stapes pushes the the fluid inside. So stapes mo mo motion causes a pressure change in the perilymph in the scala vestibulis on the top, then flows through the helicotrema and then it goes back. So we've got a constant pressure wave going up and down. And the pressure wave has exactly all the frequencies of the sound wave. Yeah. So if you've got a whole speech spectrum like when I'm talking to you, you've got all of these frequencies together. When the stapes moves in, the round window mem membrane moves out, and vice versa, and these fluid motions result in a fluctuating pressure difference between scala vestibuli and scala tympani. I got some videos that uh, might be helpful to actually understand that a bit better. Yes. Unfortunately, it's a bit small. How, c how, how well can you see that? I would like to blow that up, but I can't. Oh well. Have to live with it. Th that's a, our one turn: scala vestibulus, scala tympani. And you see here the basilar membrane. And now the pressure comes through scala vestibuli and goes out scala tympani. And this is just periodic sound. So it, it goes up with every period. This thing vibrates once up and down. Yep. You see the scala. All of these membranes actually vibrate. But this th what we're interested in is the, m is the direction of the basilar membrane. This vibration here is, is 100 times uh, enhanced, obviously. The thing is not, not moving quite that far. OK. On the organ of Corti, uh, we talk about that in a second. We can we've got better pictures. Now this is what I wanted to show you. If you go on to your um, onto Blackboard, you have a site here called Panopto now, and you can look at this lecture and all the following lectures um, from from here. So it's on on Blackboard. Just don't know why it's not visible at the moment. I'll do that later. Um, what I wanted to show you is a little. Ah, oh that's the one. No, it's not the one. Unfortunately, there is no sound. Is there sound? There ought to be sound. There is sound. Careful that it's not too loud. Wait a second. I'm going to switch that one off. Okay, this there's a guy explaining in a second what we see. Um, what we're going to see is the, the how the sound goes through the outer ear and the middle ear, through the tympanic membrane, there, through the middle ear bones, there, there, there. Here's the stapes, here's the round window. We haven't got a sound at the moment, but now we uncoil the cochlea. And then we we hear some sounds.
you see how complicated this motion is yeah you see a number of things and we'll investigate that a little bit more in detail what this actually means the sequence of specific specificity but I want to point out to you is how how you hear this as beautiful music but what the basilar membrane sees is a completely chaotic um, picture of, 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 of these sounds that obviously represents these sounds in a way and it's very uh, um, impossible for us to understand what it's doing but we hear it as a very uh, clear sound we hear harmonicities we hear frequencies we hear all sorts of things that's a tet lecture I should show you the whole thing but it's that's basically what's happening right more to this movement the Reissner membrane that's the bit that's between the scala tympani and the scala media has no impedance barrier that's irrelevant for the movement so forget about it the fluid motions and pressure results as a pressure difference across the basal and membrane at the organ of corti are complex are causing to vibrate between points of attachment that's what we mean this leads to a traveling wave that's what we just <coughs> saw the movement of the basal and membrane at different points that's called a, a traveling wave and here we have uncoiled the cochlea again here from the base to the apex and we play one sound specific sound and you can see how at different points in time one two three four this wave leads to different changes of, of the amplitude of the vibration of the basal and membrane it's a low frequency sound at four different instances in time so if you look at one point here for example where you see these red dots you would see the basal membrane go up and down and up and down and up and down if you look at the whole basal membrane like the one that we just saw in the video it looks as if the sound is, is, is having is traveling and is having a maximum um, peak pressure at one point if we put an envelope this is what this dotted line is that's the envelope over all the maximum movements so this is the maximum movement at this point so this is why we put the envelope here and and the envelope is the same negative and positives so the envelope gives you a description of the um, the sound wave at a specific for a specific sound so how the basal membrane responds to that specific sound that's static that doesn't change the envelope but this uh, is it's not actually existent the envelope the envelope is only there if we plot it over a number of a longer time okay this traveling wave has been discovered quite a while ago and is responsible or is believed to be responsible for most of the features that we can that we how we understand hearing this the patterns of the motion involved in the traveling waves are, are quite complex more complex than another wave it's ju not just a wave that travels like through air in this room if I talk here there's a very linear relationship what I say here is coming into your ears as pretty much the same wave the wave on this basal membrane is is dependent on a number of things and it and it depends specifically on the width and the the, the, the thickness of the basal membrane and as you heard and, and saw in the video different frequency sounds lead to different vibrations at different points and it starts with a very thick and, um, and narrow basal membrane which responds to very high frequencies so this is where it starts from the uh, from the base and then the traveling wave goes further and further and further and builds up over time this is what we see here so it's it, it, it starts at the base it builds up it builds up up to a maximum and then it drops down okay so the wave slowly that's it, it slowly builds up but as it does that it also slows down in amplitude and then peaks and decays almost immediately this is what we can see here for a number of frequencies so this is 500 Hertz 1 kilohertz 2 kilohertz 4 8 16 kilohertz it's a simulation of the basal membrane movement you can see well there's a number of things to see let's take this one here it's probably best to see at 2 kilohertz you can see how it builds up 
goes up to the top and then it drops down pretty rapidly. Can you see that? It's a bit small. I appreciate that. Um, what happens for higher frequencies? For higher frequencies, you get a build up at an earlier place. So 500 hertz travels the furthest and 16 kilohertz travels not very far at all. Because the basal membrane is very stiff at the base up here and very stiff things um, have much higher frequencies, they resonate at higher frequencies than much wider things. Example, maybe this table is very stiff, it's quite high frequencies. This is not very stiff, as lower frequencies. Yeah, that's just physics. The whole thing here is basically just physics, linear physics, come to think of it at the moment. Okay, so the envelope isn't plotted on here, but you can imagine the envelope is just the, um, the, the well, the envelope of all the maximum peaks. For every stimulus frequency, waves are contained within a static envelope. The position of a peak of the envelope depends uniformly on the signal frequency, and that's the place frequency map. So, repeat that again. The higher the frequency, the further it travels. So there's a monotonous relationship between frequency and place where you get maximum um, elongation or maximum amplitude. Yeah? So if you have a maximum here, you know there is a 16 kilohertz tone. Let's look at the video again and see if you recognize that from the, the, the music that was playing on there. We start. Now a fourth. Let's do the three sounds again, three pure tones. Yeah, low frequency at the apex, high frequency at the base. These are pure tones. The reason why we use pure tones in audiometry, have you asked yourself pure tones? You, you know, know how pure tones sounds, yeah? Is that a natural sound? Not very much. You don't ever hear pure tones in nature. So why should our ear be very sensitive to sounds that are completely unnatural? That's a very good question and, and quite a philosophical question. The reason why we use pure tones, well, it's basically twofold. One, because there is a thing as it's called the Fourier transformation, which means that we have a fantastically simple, elegant way of understanding sounds by transforming it into frequency domain, um, w which it means we put them, we separate them into pure tones of different frequencies. Morning. You in the right lecture? Anat what? Anatomy, physiology? No, but thanks for switching the light on. <laughs> The other reason is why we use pure tones is that they obviously stimulate the basal membrane at different frequencies. The basal membrane does a frequency transformation, does a, a separation of different frequencies uh, in different places, like, like we see here. So start with a low frequency tone, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 4000 hertz. Now, if we're interested in a damage of the basal membrane, and it's not damaged everywhere, it's usually just damaged at the beginning, we'll find out why soon, um, then you still hear the low frequencies because this bit of the basal membrane is perfectly all right. But this bit here might be damaged and that's why you have a hearing loss at the high frequencies or you only have it at low frequencies or only at mid frequencies. Okay, uh, that's the place frequency map. So, for high frequency signals, the maximum basal membrane response is near the base, and for low frequencies, it's further towards the apex. This is thought to arise from the decrease in basal membrane stiffness, and therefore natural frequency from base to apex. Natural frequency means the resonance frequency. That is the, the, the picture is the xylophone or the piano underwater. If you submerge a piano underwater, you've got a not too bad picture of the basal membrane. 
Um, because you have underwater because it's in fluid. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if it's underwater or in the um, in the air. But basically, imagine a piano keyboard. You've got the low frequency here. You've got the high frequencies there. So here's what the sound comes in. High frequencies, medium frequencies, low frequencies, and they're resonating. We're only talking about resonances here. It's passive resonances. There's a sound coming in. The basilar membrane resonates at a specific frequency. And where the resonance happens, it tells you something about the frequency. And that way, we get a frequency selectivity and a frequency transformation. Okay, here's another nice picture of that. I like that. Um, so here's the, the, the cochlea unrolled from the base to the apex. See here the helicotrema. And you've got the, the envelope. I will almost, almost ever now only talk about the envelope of this traveling wave. So you don't need to know the, the specific um, fluctuation underneath, just the envelope. 3000 hertz at the beginning, that's 16, 350 hertz at the very end. If you look at it in the coiled version, then you see that there's 20,000 right here up the base. Scala tympani, scala vestibuli, cochlear duct, and then it drops pretty c very soon from 20,000 to 7,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,500, 1,800, 600, 400, 200, and that's the apex. Now, if it really looks like that, where do you perceive 20 hertz? It's not on the, <laughs> on the agenda. Well, uh, you don't have to have, well, uh, y yes, uh, this is a bit over the top here, the picture, but it doesn't matter. It, it represents quite accurately, certainly, the, the, the most of the frequencies. Um, a few things here to, 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 to take home. The energy of the sound comes through the base, the, s the stapes, and the oval window here in the scala tympani. Now, all of the, the energy then, obviously, goes through the whole basilar membrane and comes out again. So, where and, uh, so the energy comes in at the beginning and then it decreases. So, where do you have the most energy? At the base, at the high frequencies. So, all the poor hair cells that sit right here get constantly bombarded with all the sounds. So, even the low frequency sound run because they have to run to the very end, traveling wave, they have to travel through the whole cochlea to get to the, to the apex. The high frequency sounds, they stop immediately. So the low frequency bit in the middle isn't bothered by the high frequency sounds. But a high frequency bit is very much bothered by the low frequency sound that travel through it. Yeah? Can I show you that and maybe, maybe see that here? Well, this is this is a bit of a misnomer. There is the, the, the energy for the low frequency actually results in a vibration here as well, but is it is it's small, but there it is still there. Whereas the high frequencies vibrate a lot here, then they break down, and there is a, see, there is nothing back there. So what I what I mean is there is a s asymmetry between the high frequency and the low frequencies, which means that the high frequencies get always more energy than the low frequencies, and that results in the the, 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 the typical high frequency hearing loss. So the, the hair cells at the 20 kilohertz, they're the ones that die first, very early on. You know that almost all, well, typical age-related hearing losses are high frequency losses. That is mainly the reason why. Okay, place frequency map. Over most of the frequency range, the position of the peak along the basilar membrane is proportional to the stimulus frequency, measured in octaves. Not in hertz, but in octaves. So, the difference between 200 to 400 is about the same as from 400 to 800, 800 to 1600, to 3000, and so on. So, this is what we talked about Friday in big length, about the, the octave, the, the logarithmic nature of hearing. This is where it comes from, because of the properties of the basilar membrane. Why the basilar membrane chooses to do it like that is an interesting question. I don't think there is a good answer for that. Apart from evolutionary, you can argue that we want to hear to a large range of frequencies, and you don't want to make the basilar membrane two and a half meters long. So you sacrifice the resolution at the high frequencies, 
um, for a wide, wide range. So we, we the, the the actual length of the basal membrane is only two and a half centi uh, sorry three and a half centimeters, and it covers all frequencies between well twenty hertz, twenty kilohertz. You can only do that by sacrificing something resolution, and we're more interested in the re resolution at low frequencies. So we have wide distances at low frequencies. So the difference here between 200 and 400 is 200 hertz. Between 20,000 and 200 hertz, 18,800 is just a tiny little bit here. Yeah. So you've got a much better resolution for low frequencies than for high frequencies, and that results in this close to logarithmic mapping. That is the relationship is best or is described quite often by uh, the Greenwood's formula came up in 1961. Peak position changes by 5 millimeters per octave down to 200 hertz. It's roughly agree in agreement with psychoacoustical data and consistent with physiological measurement. The it, there's actually a bit, um, there are better formulas this, these days, but this is still most frequently used for cochlear implant um, insertion. The cochlear implant, by the way, is stuck here in the sala tympani at the top, and it goes, it's a, it's a tiny little, have you seen a cochlear implant? Yeah? How long is it? It's about a millimeter and a half. So it doesn't go up all the cochlea. It, it is stuck in here. It goes right in this blue area without poking through the corner about one and a half terms. So this is one turn up to here. You can't get it further physically because you, it doesn't coil I infinitely. You can only coil it, and it's quite ingenious already that it coils one and a half times around. Um, but, it, it, it but you can only get it to frequencies down there. Now if you stimulate something, what it does is effectively, if you had an electrode up here and you stimulate it, you would hear something that has 2000 hertz. How do you know that? Greenwood's formula. Because you can't see it, but you can see what they do with the cochlear implant after implantation. They take a, uh, an x-ray and they see within the cochlear how the, the electrodes actually sit. So they can see the electrodes. They see this, uh, one electrode is there, one is there, one is there, one is there, one is there. And this electrode here, then if I switch that on, is probably the 4000 hertz um, electrode. And this is how it's mapped. It's using the Greenwood's formula. Okay, so the response at a particular site is extremely sharply tuned to the best frequency or the characteristic frequency at each, um, at each point. Sharp means that if you change the frequency slightly, the response drops dramatically, mostly to the higher frequencies, not so much to the lower frequencies. As you can see here, if you change, let's say this one here, if you change this from 16 to 16 and a half, there is nothing because it's very very sharp edge but in low frequencies it's not so sharp this will stay with us because this is psycho well perceptually extremely important and believe me or not to motivate that this shape motivates mp3 the one that you're listening to every day is captured in this shape it's basically capturing the shape of this envelope Okay, so at the end of this course you should understand how MP3 works, <laughs> but that still takes a few weeks. Um, Basler membrane response is sharply tuned, at the primary basis of the frequency selectivity in the auditory system. It, it, that's the reason how we can understand different, how we hear different frequencies. That, that all comes through the motion of the basilar membrane. That is the single reason how we gives us the ability to understand speech in background noise, or to actually separate frequencies from each other. Um, what's actually happening with the hair cells? It's a transverse displacement of the basilar me membrane, organ of corti, give rise to a horizontal shear between the rectangular lamina and the tectorial membrane. I show that in the video better. Uh, which is this one. So now we actually understand this here a bit better. We don't need the sound on that. Come to the sound next week. 
That's the organ of corti moving up and down now. And the tectorial membrane on top. And you see, now we go into the detail what the hair cells are actually doing. This is the red one here is the inner hair cell. The green one are the outer hair cells. And you see that because of the vibration of the basilar membrane, the hairs, this one here, fluctuates in the fluid. Now this is where the, the, the vibration is actually now picked up. The hair cells are the sensory cells, and we will now investigate how the vibration is translated into a chemical and then an electrical process, um, which is due to the shearing. Shearing means they're actually shearing against each other. They're not moving up and down because that wouldn't move the hairs. The hairs are moving only that way. Okay. It is thought, it's not thought, it's actually quite clear by now, that the outer hair cells are embedded in the tectorial membrane and the inner hair cells are not. Now we need to look at this carefully. The hairs of the green ones, the outer hair cells, are actually contacting the blue tectorial membrane, whereas the inner hair cells do not. Here in the motion, this is very, very small. I go back a few slides to show you that it always has been like that in the figures. Here, best picture, schematically, the outer hair cells are embedded, at least the longest, the kinocilium, is connected to the tectorial membrane, whereas the inner hair cells freely float in there. Okay, that becomes later important because that is the, s the, the reason for sensorineural hearing loss as we find out later on. Right. Auditory filter bank, yes. I'm not talking about that today because it's quite late. We need a break. And we talk about that in weeks to come. Yes, there's another... Um, the, the inner hair cells is not connected in the tectorial membrane. And... We talk about the p potentials in the next hour. Let's just summarize what we what we learned this in this lecture. The stapes motion is communicated throughout the cochlea by a fast longitudinal wave in the fluid. Longitudinal means it goes if we uncoil. We always think about the cochlea uncoiled because it's very difficult to think three dimensional. Um, so longitudinal means you start here with the wave and then it goes back and forth longitudinal as op opposed to transversal. This leads to a traveling wave. So the fluid motion is not the same motion as the motion of the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane just responds to the wave because at every point on the basilar membrane you get a, a, a motion at the top, the vestibuli, uh, scala vestibuli, scala tympani. You get a vibration and the basilar membrane picks this up and vibrates as a in response to that. And that leads, if you look at it over the whole thing, it looks like a traveling wave. It looks as if the wave is building up from the from the low frequency, from the high frequency, sorry, up to the low frequencies and then breaks down. The peak of the envelope depends on the frequency. That's the place frequency map. And the basilar membrane motion leads to deflection of the stereocilia on the hair cells, which open ion channels, leading to flow of ions into the hair cells, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. Let me do a little bit of a break. Okay. Now switch I off the recording. No, I, I hold it. We're recording again. Who's missing? Two, three people? Quite a lot. Okay. Sorry, you can listen to it on online. Right. Where we left the basilar membrane with a summary. Now we make a break. This is a reminder. The inner and outer hair cells. Outer hair cells, inner hair cells. This is an electromicroscope uh, view on it. These are the, what we actually see are not the hair cells, are the stereocilia, the hairs. So this is one outer hair cell. This is one inner hair cells. And you can clea clearly see the three rows of outer, one row of inner hair cells three to five rows of outer hair cells, which is in total about 12,000 in each ear. 12,000 hair cells. We're talking about thousands of hair cells 
not about millions. That compares to, if you look at the retina, the retina has hundreds of millions of cells. So if a few million of them die, if a few thousand of them die, you wouldn't even notice it. If a few thousand of your hair cells die, you will notice it because you will have a significant loss in some area. The big problem with these hair cells is um, that they cannot be regenerated. They cannot heal themselves. So if a hair cell is gone, it's gone. Which is quite uh, interesting s research topic, probably the biggest research topic in, not, not in audiology, but in, 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 in auditory sciences, is how to regenerate hair cells. And the key to that might well be genetic um, 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 cure, a genetic cure. There has been a Nature paper already earlier this year where they demonstrated that they can do that in mice. They can, um, they can regrow with stem cells, they can get hair cells to regrow and actually develop stereocilia. There's only one of the issues you have to solve. The other issue is you have to actually attach them to nerve cells later on again. But there's almost, you can think, they're halfway there. My prediction is, well, always has been in 20 years, probably, I don't know, 2030, it will be possible, hopefully, to regrow hair cells. And that will hopefully mean that we're all out of a job. We won't need audiologists very much anymore because you can properly, hopefully, heal hearing loss for the first time ever. That would be good. Right, what are outer hair cells? Cylindrical in shelp, uh, shape, they have about 150 stereocilia. These are these ones here, so these are each individual hairs. This, the tallest row of stereocilia, these are on the, on the, on the top here, are embedded in the tectorial membrane. Um, they're called kinocilia, and they're supported only at the base and the apex. Lateral walls are free. And the inner hair cells look slightly different. They are not so much V-shaped. They're more like, like, uh, uh, well, like a little half row, single row of hair cells. We've got about 3,500 of them, about 50 stereocilia. They're not contacted by the tectorial membrane, and they're supported all along. So here's the outer hair cell, blown up schematically. Here's the, the, the schematic uh, um, stereocilia on top. Um, we have um, there's a very st st strict structure here. Uh, they're very um, strong in their in their cell membrane. In fact, what they are supported with is a, a surface um, which is full of prestine. That has been discovered about five six years ago. And prestine is a, a motor protein. It is in the same family as actin and myosin. You know actin and myosin act together to make muscles. And prestine is doing the same thing, but much, much faster. How fast can you um, vibrate a muscle, contract a muscle? Maybe a few times a second, maybe hundreds of times a second, if you're really, really good. Um, but prestine can vibrate uh, 100,000 times a second. So that can actually contract these cells um, in, in the whole range of the auditory frequencies, which is for a human 20 kilohertz, but for a bat can be up to 200 kilohertz. We've got the nucleus here, and we've got the efferent nerve endings, so nerve cells that are attached at the bottom. The inner hair cells, as a comparison, these are the, the, the hairs on the top, they look very different. They look more like a normal cell, a bit thicker at the bottom, got the nucleus here, they've got the, the kinocilium here, and they have then a lot more nerve cells attached to them at the bottom, and uh, they don't have a cell wall that is anything to write home about. Okay, um, they're obviously different. The stereocilia on the top, um, did they detect the vibrations within the cochlea. Um, they're composed of actin filaments, so they're very rigid. There's three to four rows of these stereocilia, usually. Um, we have, usually they go from, no, not usually, they always go from the, sh the short ones at the, the, at the front to the top one there. The highest uh, stereocilia is called the um, kinocilium. The height of the stereocilia increases along the length of the basilar membrane. And there are tip links in between. And they become actually important later on. They're very hard to see. There's one, there's one, these ones here, very, very small. They're schematically drawn here in the next one. 
but th they're actually connected to each other. The point of that is if they move, you, you remember they're actually shearing. And the shearing motion of, say, the longest one will open a gate through the tip links in the next one. And so you get a, a, a gate open, and what happens with the gate? You we said that there is a, in the scala media, it's the endolymph. Um, we have a lot of potassium, and the potassium flows inside of the cell because in the in the in, in, in the um, the cell has a low potassium usually. Okay, that's the the the, the principle, the the, the the main chemical principle. What what we measure is how we discovered that is by measuring electric potentials. We have a number of potentials that we need to discuss now. First of all, the endocochlear potential which is about 80 plus 80 millivolts, which means um, between the, the endolymph in here and, say, the perilymph, which the rest of the hair cell swims in, which we can say is, is, is just zero. We, we have to set zero somewhere because it's a relative measure. Let's say it is zero in outside of the cell, then we've got plus 80 millivolt out there. And cells everywhere in the body, usually, always, are slightly negative. So they always have a uh, between 45, 70 millivolt negative potential. 70 is the inner hair cell. Minus 45 is the, the outer hair cell. This is what why it says minus 45 or minus 70. Um, minus 45, no, minus 45 inner hair cells, minus 70 outer hair cells. So what is the, the, the total uh, potential between the endolymph and the inside of the hair cell? Let's say for the for the outer hair cells, 80 plus 70, so 150 millivolt gradient, which is a lot for neurons, uh, or for for anywhere in the in the body. Now, what happens with the positive charged potassium ions that swim out here? They are pressed by this potential difference in there, because here's a positive charge, and the positive charge want to, well, nature uh, wants to get rid of a, of a, of a charge, they al always want to get a zero charge. So all the pluses here, the positive potassiums, flow through the gates whenever they can into the cell. And what do they do there? They reduce the membrane potential. So that's called the endo endocochlear potential at the, at the outside. And we have the intracellular resting potential that's maintained by cellular ion transfer. Okay. Um, um, just just quickly, because we're here already, what happens then? When the membrane potential rises, it will ch it will open gates at the um, in, in in the in the cell wall of the inner hair cell and the outer hair cells, which then lets calcium in in terms, and the calcium binds to neurotransmitter that are released into the synaptic cleft and then lead to action potentials here in the, in the attached nerve cells. It's a process we'll talk about le later on a little bit. This is just the schematic view of all of them. So we've got basically two main um, chemicals that we need to remember, potassium in the scala media flowing into the hair cell, calcium flowing as a consequence of that, and then cal calcium leads to release of neurotransmitter. It's a third chemical. It's usually acetylcholine, which is then um, going in the, in the uh, leads to action potentials. Okay, so deflection of the hair bundles opens or closes the ion channels. Tip links of stereocilia typically pull them open. That causes the influx of ion currents through the cell, the potassium. That changes the membrane potential that causes calcium to flow in. Calcium causes the release of the neurotransmitter. And this conversion of mechanical energy into electrical energy is called mechanoelectrical transduction. And now we have our mechanical pressure wave, the air transmitted into something electrical that the brain can work with. OK. Hair cell depolarization. Um, yes, um, this is going to show because w you might ask what happens if we, the, the, the movement, the, s the shearing motion moves in both directions. It can either open these gates or close them. 
what we usually, which is 99% correct, is that they can actually only open um, and not close more than they close. In, in reality, they open a tiny little bit when they're when there's quiet, and then they can actually open fully, and then they can close a little bit more than in their resting potential. But this is what this slide is about. So the deflection from the hair cells away from the modi modiolus does everything that I just said. Opens the ion channel, increases the current in into the cell, depolarizes the cell, and so on. And conversely, the deflection towards modiolus reduces a little bit the likelihood of firing. Okay, now an overview of the electric potentials. We've got three potentials that we can measure and that we need to understand. First of all, the resting potentials that we already discussed within the cells, minus 70 or minus 45, and inside the endolymph uh, plus 80. They do not depend on the stimulation. They're just always there. But if we actually stimulate the cochlea with sound, we get receptor potentials. Receptor potentials because we can measure them, we can receive them from outside, and they're generated by the hair cells. And what we can measure is cochlear microphonics and summation potentials. The cochlear microphonics, CMs, they're generated by the battery model, uh, and they, they vary with the stimulus. And the summation potentials um, are generated by the traveling wave, like AC and there are other ones, not DC. I'll show that in a second. Here, here's what's, what's happening. The hair cell potentials, I'd say there's a sound, pure tone, coming in acoustically into the ear canal. Uh, that leads to a the this is the the, the the membrane potential that we actually measure with regard to bone. So this is slightly negative. This is zero. So that's say minus 70, for example. And then the sound starts, and with a little bit of a delay. Where does this delay comes from? A few milliseconds. Because of the traveling wave. The traveling wave actually takes some time to travel to this point. This is a measurable few milliseconds. And then w once it's there, it starts and it goes up and then it, it, it fluctuates up and down. And we can split typically a, 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 a wave like that into two aspects, namely a DC, a direct current, and an AC, an alternating current part. Yeah. That's general, it's always done, because you want, to, you want to, to know how much it is above zero on average and how it fluctuates around the average. And this DC and the AC are, in turns, the cochlear microphonics and the summation potentials. That's what they're called. Okay, here's a sort of real measurement, but this is just to, to show what they, um, how this DC and AC component look like. If you have a measurement like that, you basically subtract the average, that's the DC, and then you, um, the other bit that you have is, is the, the AC alternating current, which goes around zero now. Okay, the steady state DC or fluctuating AC part, um, they both exist. The resting potential does exist in quiet, th which is DC, which is the endocochlear potential, plus the resting potential, and the receptor potential, um, is the one that, that is in, in two parts, cochlear microphonics, um, AC and DC part. So this is a very, um, very complex figure. It shows, as a response of a, in, in response to a tone pulse, which is on here during 45 milliseconds of the um, on this bar. So it's a sound of different frequencies, namely 300, 500, 7, 900, 2000, 3000, 4000, 5000. So they're just offset to split them up so that we can see them all. And they are measured in response in, 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 um, in respect to the surrounding bones. And you can see that at the low frequencies, the, the microphonics follow the waveform exactly without any DC. So th th they go around zero and they follow pretty much exactly the waveform of the sound. I can't prove that here, but if you measure the, the wavelength of the response, it will turn out to be exactly the wavelength of the sound, 300 hertz. So at low frequencies, the thing is pretty um, boring almost because the hair cells, the stereocilia, um, respond exactly 300 times per second 
and the membrane potential changes 300 times per second. This is slow enough for the cell to follow one-to-one -one, on a cycle-to-cycle -cycle basis, that's called. Now if we go to higher frequencies, something interesting happens. 500 hertz still works, 700, 900 still works, 1000 hertz, or 1500, I don't know what that actually is. Um, you see there's something else coming in, namely, a sort of it struggles to follow between here and here, it struggles to follow every individual pulse because it's too sluggish. There are too many things in there that can go wrong. The hair cells, the, the stereocilia are not opening and, and things like that. They just don't work very well above a few kilohertz. So what happens instead is that you get a DC component. So here you don't have any DC component, but the, the higher the frequency, the more the DC component. So what you effectively get, here you get the a little bit DC and then a little bit of AC and it, it, the higher the frequency the, the less AC you get and the more DC. Yeah? You could say in signal processing terms what you do what, what you see here is a low pass filtering of the sound uh, plus a half wave rectification because you see the envelope. What this is the envelope of the sound without the fine structure. So you don't see the wiggling bits anymore but you do see as, as long as the sound is on, you see the envelope. Here at 300 hertz, you see both. You see the envelope plus the whole of the fine structure. And everything in between is uh, something in the middle. You see a little bit of DC and a little bit of AC. That leads to, perceptually, a lot of consequences, including a f range of frequencies that we can make music and things like that. And um, and, and this all depends on how well we can actually separate this th these individual peaks in each of these frequencies. And for us humans, usually this breaks down between around 2000 hertz, maybe 4000 hertz, and this is the frequency where we cannot perceive pitch of a, of a sound anymore. Um, and that leads us already to the consequence of the hypothesis pitch is actually coded in the fine structure of the membrane potential of the cochlear microphonics. And we will investigate that a bit more in, 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 in future. There's a bit more to that, but this is basically what it is. Okay, cochlear receptor potentials, how, how does this battery theory work? Co CRP, cochlear receptor potential is both fluctuating, AC and steady, DC. Remember that an inner hair cell's depolarization causes neurotransmitter release. So um, in, in the inner hair cells, they can be released every time at, at a peak of this. Every time here, neurotransmitter is released. Chuk, 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 chuk. <laughs> in phase with the stimulus. Here as well, here as well. But here, it stops working in phase. There will be neurotransmitter released continuously. As long as the sound is on, it will be released. For low frequencies, it will only be released at certain points during the stimulus. Right, this, this battery is a combination of the endocochlear and the intracellular potential. Because the hair cells contain ion channels, a certain percentage of which are open at a particular time. And we have this battery, the, as a battery I now mean, the, the, um, the potassium ions that flow through the hairs through the stereocilia into the hair cell. That acts as a battery because you get a current influx of, of ions. In quiet the system is in equilibrium which means there are very few ions flowing through the stereocilia and they're pumped out at the bottom and you get a resting potential of plus 80 minus 45 volts, uh, millivolts. Um, but when, this is I when there's a sound input this is modulated and you get more influx. Okay, that can be measured in animals using tiny electrodes inserted into the cells, into the hair cells. You can actually measure the membrane potentials. So this is what we actually measure here as well. This is an inner hair cell potential. So somebody managed to get an electrode into the hair cell, into one specific hair cell, and measure all of these responses. Uh, in fact, this is not one hair cell. These are one, two, three, four, five, ten hair cells. Um, we can measure the combined electrical activity with a large number, yes. We can, that, that's the idea that we want to measure one hair cell, but we can measure much, much easier 
the combined activity um, using an electrode some distance away. So for example, um, well, ideally outside of the ear, but that's quite difficult. Uh, the best way to measure it is to measure with an electrode and put it onto the round window. So you go with the electrode through the tympanic membrane and put it directly onto the round window because there you directly in contact with the... you're not sticking the electrode through the round window. Why not? Because then the endolymph, the, uh, the, the perilymph leaks out. You don't want that. Um, but you don't do much damage to the tympanic membrane. I, I w had that done on myself. I did an experiment to measure that um, and I didn't even feel that. So that's not a problem. Uh, th that repairs after a day or so, that tiny hole. But what do you measure then? It's the, the summary potential of all of the hair cells, inner hair cells and outer hair cells. And that's um, because we're, we're listening to thousands of them. It's a bit like listening to a football crowd uh, because they're all stimulated in, 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 in various ways. And that's what's called electrocochleography, or that you measure these ways, the ECOCs. I show here one ECOC, electrocochleogram. And it consists of two main parts, namely the S, the CAP and the CM. And the, the CM is the cochlear microphonic. That's what we already discussed. So this has the AC and the DC component. And at the beginning is the co compound action potential, which looks very different from what we've seen before, because this is actually not generated by hair cells. It's generated by the nerves that are there as well. So they play a big role, and if we sum over all this thing, why do we want to do that? Because we can. We can actually measure that in humans, which is